right. Hey, let's head to the uh, phones, and Dr. Marshall Baca, Jr. from Artesia General Hospital joins us. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. How are you? Hey, we're doing great. So glad you uh, could take time to be with us this morning. I know how busy things have been at Artesia General Hospital, and I think let's just kind of start off in, uh, with, with this um, recent spike in the number of COVID infections and cases. How are we looking at uh, Artesia General and, and uh, our health care here in southeast New Mexico? Yeah, it's been a rough couple of weeks, you know, not only locally, but statewide in West Texas. We've definitely seen an exponential increase over the last couple of weeks, um, which at one point towards the end of last week, we were exceeding hospital capacity here in Artesia, and we had some ER holds, couldn't get people out to Lubbock, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. We were looking at places like Phoenix, Salt Lake, Fort Worth, so it's been, it's been rough. We're definitely kind of seeing this significant surge like other places and hotspots in the U.S., Sure, and in looking at the state's report, the Department of Health's report from yesterday, it looks like hospitalizations in New Mexico went down from the Friday report, but they're still uh, significantly higher than they were just uh, just a month and a half ago, uh, you know, six, seven weeks ago. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. They've increased by almost double in the last month or so, but over the weekend it seemed like things kind of cooled down a little bit, but what that still means for us, just so everyone's aware, is even though hospitalizations have kind of gone down in the state as a whole, a lot of the tertiary facilities that we refer to are still exceeding capacity, um, because obviously they offer services that small critical access hospitals like us don't. So. You know, some of those even non-COVID critical patients that we would typically send out, we just have nowhere to send them. Now, uh, we've seen probably Eddy County, uh, from a from a percentage standpoint, percent of population standpoint, is probably the the biggest jump in new cases in any county uh, in New Mexico. Um, when, when uh, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you know from these cases if they're from people that have been previously been vaccinated or if they've previous previously had COVID-19 or are these uh, cases primarily amongst people who have never been vaccinated or never had COVID before? No, yeah, we're, we're kind of seeing in line with what the U.S. is seeing. The vast majority of those new cases, uh, and yes, we are number one in the state. As a matter of fact, Carlsbad over the weekend was the number one zip code in the state and Artesia was number seven. Um, but no, the vast majority of new cases are the unvaccinated. Um, we are seeing some breakthrough cases like elsewhere, but those cases tend to be more mild and those patients are actually going home. Uh, very few of those are being admitted and even fewer are having, you know, increased mortality and morbidity. Um, so yeah, no, it's mainly the unvaccinated. And just to kind of compare, um, I also work at University Medical Center in El Paso, Texas, and El Paso County has significantly higher vaccination rate than Eddy County. And I recently, about a week and a half ago, did a few shifts there and, and saw very few COVID cases. So a lot of the a lot of the surge here and spike is due to having low vaccination numbers. Is there a way to know? Because there's been a lot of talk in the news and in the media about the Delta variant, and I guess there are some other variants as well. But the Delta one seems to be the most prominent one that's discussed. Is there a way to know which variant a person has been infected with, or or how does that process work? Not not in real time, unfortunately for us in the emergency room. Um, the state lab is trying to, and we do have the Delta variant officially seen in Eddy County, but that's coming from the state lab, and that's, you know, days down the road. So it doesn't really, there's not much utilization for us in the ER. You know, it's, COVID is COVID, regardless of the variant, but down the road, there is ways to confirm which variant. And, and, and again, I want to ask, on, on people who have already had COVID before, is that considered a breakthrough case if they get COVID again, or how is that type of infection, or are you even seeing that type of reinfection occurring? You know, it's kind of it's kind of in line with those that are vaccinated. Um, we're still learning a lot about the amount of antibodies we have, whether you've been infected or vaccinated or both. Um, 
but no, the breakthrough terminology is kind of being reserved for those who are vaccinated. But no, we are we are seeing people who you know were vac were excuse me who were infected early on in the the pandemic who are kind of getting a second go at it. So um, it, it it's both. Um, I will tell you that those individuals who were infected a while ago, as well as those who were vaccinated a long time ago. Um, those are tending to be the ones that are kind of getting infected. There have been a few breakthrough cases that people have been vaccinated in April, but I'll tell you anecdotally here in this area, I've seen the majority of breakthrough cases are those who were fully vaccinated back in January and February. Which is raises an interesting question because that's one of the things that we just don't know is how long these vaccines will be infected or a prior infection or will be effective or how long a prior infection will be effect effective we we just don't know not not enough time has passed and i guess we're learning on the fly as far as that's concerned no that is correct um we we do know that vaccines are safe and very effective and you know depending on which vendor you look at obviously they have their own data because they've done their own research but i know pfizer which the majority of people in artesia received just because we got more of an allocation of that um, pfizer came out and said that antibodies were good about eight months out but they're also stating that a third dose or a booster dose is going to be required we just don't know what that time frame looks like and when it's going to you know be approved and recommended by the cdc one of the things that you hear discussed from time to time is the difference between an immunization and a, and a vaccination. And I know the big push right now is to get the vaccine. Um, is somebody who is vaccinated, are they immunized against this or are they simply um, building up a resistance to uh, uh, this type of uh, infection? Yeah, we, we use those, you know, kind of interchangeably. The, the reality is, you know, we, we have never once said in the beginning of all this that vaccination is 100% effective and that you're not going to get COVID if you're vaccinated. The, the theory behind any vaccination is that your body's building an immune response, right? So that's why we call it an immunization. So, yes, you are building an immune response to be able to recognize that virus if you happen to be exposed and quote unquote infected and the theory is you know you have the immune response to fight it and not get severe disease um there have been a significant amount of exposures you know within the hospital and the community that i'm aware of with vaccinated people who have not you know been infected and there's been others that they have um but they've had, like I mentioned earlier, a much milder course, mm -hmm. uh, not requiring oxygen at home, not requiring admission, you know, so on and so forth. So it appears as though that the vaccinations are indeed working overall. And I know another concern that people have expressed over the vaccines is side effects or other uh, health effects or impacts in, in other areas. I, I know somebody who said that they can stick the magnet on their arm uh, or they could for a while where the where the injection site was what what have you seen from this particular vaccination in terms of impact that it has had on patients you, i think you said this earlier that the vaccines are safe um, uh, have, have you seen any uh, ill effects from people who have been vaccinated i haven't personally obviously there's case reports worldwide but you know the reality anything that we do in medicine that's why we consent i mean it's it's all with risk i mean there's not anything in medicine that is 100 percent safe so yeah i mean there's there's going to be those individuals that unfortunately have an adverse reaction but by far the the majority of people that i've seen here in artesia have had very mild adverse reactions meaning like maybe a rash some kind of small allergic reaction but that's well publicized prior to getting the vaccine. I mean, you're signing a consent, you understand the risks that are involved, but overall, if you look at mortality, i.e. death from the vaccine, um, very low, very, very, very low. I'm talking 0.01%, you know, with millions and millions of people vaccinated. Uh, so the risk of the vaccine scientifically is much, much, much lower than the long-term course of actually being infected with COVID. And um, some people have said they're not wanting to get the vaccine until the FDA fully approves it. Right now, it's it's for what, what's the proper term? Experimental or or oh, no, emergency use. Emergency use, not not experimental. Please, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use that. No, you're okay. <laughs> I just said the wrong thing. Um, for emergency use, um, do you see enough data being gathered now that the FDA may 
uh, what they may do. They may come out and actually fully approve this uh, vaccine here in the near future. I think so. I mean, you know, a lot of the hesitancy with a lot of people is, you know, historically the process that vaccines or any kind of medication for that for that matter go through before being FDA approved. But, you know, the reality of our situation is this is a pandemic and we're trying to get ahead of this thing. And the data that has been shown in the vast amount of numbers that have been studied, I think absolutely. I think overall, like I've mentioned, it's very safe and it's very effective. So I don't know what the FDA's timeline is, but no, I would not be surprised in the near future if it is officially approved. Is there anybody that you're aware of that should not get the vaccine? No, I think, you know, it's kind of hard to to speak for everyone on blanket terms. Um, But, you know, you have to have, depending on what your comorbidities are or your underlying conditions, I think you need to have those conversations with your primary care and your specialist. But I think overall, you know, if if you're worried and you're that delicate of a patient and you're having to have those conversations, I think it's even more of a reason to get vaccinated. But again, you know, everyone should have that conversation with with someone who knows them more than I do. Sure. And what's interesting is we're seeing a lot of pressure on the part of governments to pressure private sector businesses. Uh, Government agencies are doing this now to require employees, to require students, to require customers to uh, to be vaccinated or sh- show proof of vaccination, um, I wonder how much that pushes people who are skeptical ske- skeptical about getting vaccinated, even more skeptical about getting vaccinated. I know that's not a medical question, but it is. You know, you wonder why the vaccination rate is as low as it is in a place like Eddy County. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you've seen there. There's. As it's gone on, it's become more political and less scientific, which is, you know, frustrating on our end. Um, And everyone has their own political narrative and whatever fits kind of their mold. But I'm not going to all I'm going to say is I'm pro vaccine 100 percent. And it it does work Um, in regardless of your belief, even if you're one that says absolutely not, I'm I'm not going to get vaccinated. I still urge you, you know, from the bare bones of it when it began the the masking the social distancing good hand hygiene all that just continue to do that because it does help mitigate spread regardless of your vaccination well and let's talk about the masks uh if you don't mind because that's another hot topic right now um, a lot of folks went to the school board meeting last night encouraging our school board to vote to make masks uh, optional and not mandated as the state has done what what from from a medical perspective uh, what 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 do we need to know about masking and especially when we're talking about younger kids in you know uh, kindergarten first second grade uh, kids sure. and so forth yeah again nothing in science is a hundred percent but what we've seen especially during this pandemic and the decrease in flu is that masks do work they absolutely work and with this delta variant there's a lot of states exceeding capacity within their own pediatric wards and their pediatric icus so kids for all intents and purposes seem to be more affected by this delta variant that we know of right now so i'm 100 percent for mask wearing i think it helps mitigate spread it's not 100 percent proof by any means but if you really look at kind of virology 101 and the amount of viral particles that you're exposed to kind of you know for lack of a better explanation kind of coincide with the type of response that you're going to have against being exposed and potentially it correlates with how ill you're going to be. So if you're able to wear masks and that decreases, you know, the viral load that you've been exposed to, that that means not only are you potentially unlikely to get infected, but if you do, you'll have a milder course. and You may not be able to spread it as easily as those who are, you know, infected with more viral particles. So I 100% for mask wearing. And as far as mask wearing, especially in the younger ages... Um, do you do we run the risk as a as a society or as a population that if we're if we're so protecting ourselves from this particular virus that we don't get exposed to other things that we need to be exposed to in order to build up an immunity, especially in the younger in the younger age population? How, how do you weigh those uh, against each other? 
No, I think, I mean, I, I think that's a legitimate concern for sure. But uh, until we kind of wrap our heads around and know more about COVID, I, I think, you know, COVID right now is the immediate threat. Um, I will say, you know, regardless of how long your kid's in school, they're g- still going to be socializing with kids outside of school without masks. They're still going to family functions without masks. So you're still going to be, you know, and they're still going to be going to the local supermarkets and touching stuff and then touching their face. So I think the exposure is still going to be there to some degree. It may not be to the extent that it is without masks, uh, but I think the risk right now of being infected with COVID and us not knowing what those long-term effects are, especially on our end when we're seeing a young person without any medical problems come in with lungs basically on both sides covered with what we call COVID pneumonia, we don't know what that means for them in 10 years. We don't know if that is going to be problematic for them moving forward and they're going to be someone that's going to be on oxygen for the last three decades of their life. We, we just don't know. So I, I, I get the concern of not exposing our kids fully to everything that's out there because that's how kids d- develop their immune response. But th- the reality is they're still going to be exposed to everything. Um, it's just mitigating that COVID spread. It is interesting that you mention that because the when the COVID first started coming through across the country last year, it looked like it was primarily affecting older population with underlying health issues. But what you're seeing is that this Delta variant is uh, not that specific. It's It affects a little bit wider range uh, age group of people. Absolutely. If you look at the statistics across the nation and even some of the people that we've had to admit here, there have been a lot of 20, 30, 40 year olds without any underlying health problems being hit hard and requiring oxygen, requiring admission. And like I'd mentioned earlier, there's a lot of pediatric <laughs> hospitals in you know Texas, Oklahoma that are exceeding capacity with sick kiddos. So it is, uh, well, it is a variant. <laughs> and, and this right. is not, and I think for a lot of people, this is new to them because I don't think in their lifetime they've not really experienced anything like this. But is this this is not an unusual behavior for a virus, is it? No, no, not at all. I mean, if you look at um, influenza, flu, you know, we, we get a lot of people get vaccinated every single year against influenza. And some years the vaccine works great, and some years it doesn't. It's because even the influenza strains continue to kind of evolve. And so each year is going to be a little bit different for sure. I mean, that's viruses are unique in that aspect that they're, they're smart. And they, I mean, we're, we're already over, I think a hundred variants with COVID Delta is just being very problematic right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and where do these names come from? I, I, when, they, when I first heard the Delta variant and then I heard there was a Lambda variant, I thought these people are watching Revenge of the Nerds or Animal House sure. or something like that. Where, where do these... I, don't, I don't know how they pick. Just like I don't know how they pick hurricane names, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So what, uh, uh, what, what advice then would you offer to people um, on one hand who are on the fence or haven't been vaccinated yet or are looking for information to make an informed decision about whether or not they should get vaccinated. Yeah, if they've already had, you know, conversations with their primary or their specialist and they're still on the fence or if you don't have one, I mean, I I don't, if I'm on shift, I will 100% be more than happy to feel the phone call if they want to call the emergency room that's not a big deal and i can try to answer your questions as much as possible without necessarily knowing all of your underlying conditions but um you know there's a lot of good stuff on the internet um it just kind of depends on the avenue you know if you're someone that wants to speak to someone give us a call if you're someone that is okay with kind of doing your own reading i mean there is tons of stuff on the new mexico medical board there's tons of information out there Right. And as far as the, the mask question, because, again, that that a lot of people look at that as a personal liberty issue. They, they don't want to be mandated to do these things. But if you wanted to get more information on the, the whole question of the, the benefits or uh, issues with masks, are there re- I'm sure there's resources out there to, to answer those yes, questions. Same. Absolutely. It's um, the same thing. They can call if they want, but it's all over the Internet as well. I mean, you've you got to understand, though, when it comes to scientific data and literature, you, you want to be a little bit 
of an investigator. You know, you don't want to find some kind of social forum that has their own political agenda that doesn't have any references. I'm, I'm talking about pure scientific stuff, um, keeping politics out of it. If you really look at the literature and you look at an article that is unbiased and there's no, you know, financial gain to the author and they have multiple references, that's probably the source that you're going to want to look at. And one, one other question just kind of came to mind. There's been a lot of talk about herd immunity. Uh, and at what point do we achieve that or do we get to that point or is in, or is that even a realistic uh, goal or objective in this in, in this particular pandemic that we're in right now what what to you what is what does herd immunity look like or how would you define that as as uh, reaching a point where we maybe we're beyond the pandemic point with this particular virus yeah i think if you if you look historically and you know viruses bacteria every fungi everything acts differently but if, you, if we'll just use 80 percent as kind of our benchmark um again without knowing how long those antibodies exist between the vaccine or being infected you know because obviously those antibodies aren't going to exist in perpetuity but if you're reaching for 80 percent you're reaching for 80 percent of those who have been infected and vaccinated you know nationwide um and we're just not we're just not there yet right i think 65 percent is the vaccination number but you don't and a lot of those people have well and that's for the united states as a whole right and, but if you if you look at any county unfortunately we're only 31 percent. oh no right right no you're right 65.3 percent in new mexico 18 and older but yeah you drill down into the county level it's it's much lower than that you are yeah. absolutely correct uh one other comment uh, pam had on the on the facebook page seems every common ailment doesn't exist anymore it's all COVID 19 related it does seem that way dr baca just from the news coverage but you're the healthcare in america is not just dealing with covid right now there's still other things that uh, that that you're dealing with right oh yeah we still have we still have run-of-the-mill community acquired pneumonia strep you know the common cold um I, I think the narrative right now is all covid and that's all you're hearing about especially during these these time periods where we're surging but no, I mean, <clears throat> and I think that's what's frustrating for the public, too, is that's all, you know, you guys are being exposed to. And I can I get why that can be frustrating. But no, we're, we're seeing absolutely everything. I mean, even the critical non-COVID stuff, the, the reality is that everyone has to realize, though, regardless of of your vaccination opinion, like I mentioned, I scientifically masks go a long way good hand hygiene social distancing and i just i, I just want to urge everyone to understand that if, if it's one of your loved ones that even comes in with a non-covid critical condition that we don't have a specialist to take care of you know they're waiting two three days before we can find a, a tertiary care facility for them to go to to be taken care of which you know prolonged <clears throat> delays in care increase mortality which is death and morbidity which is basically a poor outcome so we really just have to kind of work as a community to try to mitigate this whether you're vaccination uh, or whether you're for vaccinations or against i just urge everyone to continue to do their due diligence and and wear masks wash hands and try to avoid large gatherings until we get on the other side of this thing very good dr marshall baca jr thank you so much for your time and uh, any other time you want to come on and share some information with us, we're, we're here for you to, uh, to get that out. All right. Well, I appreciate you. You have a good one. Be safe. All right. You too. Thank you very much. Dr. Marshall Baca, Jr. from Artesia General Hospital. And we appreciate his time. We'll uh, get that.